Good evening. Until this moment, I didn't know what I'm going to speak, I can tell you. It happens every time with me. Even if I prepare everything, when I stand here, things start coming to my mind. What I know is that I want to pass you a message about how you can change the world and how you can make things better around you, for the others, not only for you, but for everyone. Something was said about this world and the developing of this world. Now it's much beyond that. It's the whole emergency system, in fact, we are talking about in Romania. But before that, I have a question which I usually ask before I start. How many of you think that you are reasonable people? Raise your hands, please. How many of you think that you are not reasonable people? Okay, well, I am very unreasonable. At least this is what, how many people see me. Why? Because reasonable people in the definition of others are people who are very harmonious. They don't fight for ideas. They don't disturb others. They are very quiet. They meld well with the society and they evolve slowly with the society. Unreasonable people from the point of view of others usually are people who are coming with things that the others are not very comfortable with. They want to change things. They want to do things better sometimes. And the issue is that reasonable people usually don't change the world. It's the unreasonable ones who change the world. So being unreasonable, it means to dream, to dare to say, that this thing needs to be changed and to make things better and to fight for your ideas but at the same time it's not only fighting for the ideas but proving them right based on a lot of information you get from what you are doing from what others are doing i had a very good chance in the 80s when i was a student in medicine in the end of the 80s i wrote letters to be received as a practitioner student in the UK. And I was received and I went there and saw what it means to be in the emergency system. Then I traveled a lot when I was a resident in anesthesia and critical care. And I talked to people who founded their own emergency systems. Why did you do it this way? Why didn't you do it that way? Why did you do this? Why didn't you do that? And my dream at that moment was a small one. It was to create a team which goes out for critical cases because I was seeing how patients were being brought to the hospital dead or near dead when they were in critical conditions. And there was no help that they were getting, whether they were in the streets or whether they were arriving to the hospital alive, but in a very much critical condition, which could have been made better if there was someone to do this in the right way. So from this point of view, I wanted really to do some change. So the first attempt was in, the, in 1990. I tried to do something in Cluj. And people at the beginning said, yes, it's a good idea. Until they saw the first impact of it. Arriving in five or six minutes, the others appreciating it, the first five, six emergencies, and they said, no, 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 stop, it's not good. You have to stop, you cannot do it anymore. That was people from the union, from the ambulance union, which didn't want that. Though the attempt was to do this together with them. Then I fought for six months. Some people supported me, others stopped me. And then someone told me, there is another crazy guy like you in Turgumuresh. Go and talk to him. He's a professor of anesthesia. He may help you. So I went and talked to the head of the intensive care department in the anesthesia, the late professor Kiriano. I told him, what I want to do, I had a car, my own car, which I put on it, blue lights. It was written doctor on it, and it had a defibrillator. It had equipment in it, and it was very new for Romania at that time. There was nothing like this at that time in Romania. So he came and saw it, and he said, this was my dream also. I will help you to do it here. And that was the first team to go out for emergencies in Romania, for real emergencies, and to be able to do something 
and to do this frequently, not only for one time, but to start doing this. And we were doing it completely volunteer, in a, on a volunteering basis with my colleagues. Now things evolved. And I started seeing that this piece of the system is not working well. That piece of the system is not working well. And I started wanting to change things. And of, of course, I started becoming more and more unreasonable for the others. Because I was saying, we are bringing the patients to the emergency area and they are dying because nobody is receiving them from us. We are leaving to another emergency. We come back, we find the patient dead. So who's going to take care of the patient in the emergency room? There were no emergency departments like we have them now in Romania. And we started working on finding people to help us. People who dreamt that dream sometime before us. And we found a very great person, a professor from Scotland, Keith Little, who we wrote him, he accepted, he came, he looked at what we were doing. We wrote to the fire brigade in Scotland from Glasgow, the Strathclyde Fire Brigade. We told them, you know, we don't have any rescue equipment if there is an accident. We used to pull the cars between each other to take out patients. There were no extrication equipment in Romania whatsoever in the beginning of the 90s. Zero. So an officer from Strathclyde Fire Brigade flew to Romania and came to Turgumuresh to see what we were doing. And they came, they had a look, and they said, we will help you. The first step was to create a resuscitation room in the emergency reception area of the hospital. And at the same time, Strathclyde Fire Brigade, they said, we will donate to you a car with all the equipment, but we will come and train you as well. So it was not only throwing equipment on us, it was passing their knowledge to us. And that was extremely important. They came in the 1993. The resus room was opened. In one year, we dropped mortality in that area of the hospital by 50%. And the rescue unit, when they were delivering it to us on a big ceremony, we got a call, there is a guy in an accident and he is trapped in the car. So I said, okay, that's excellent. I went to, the, to John, John Klenekham. John, we have an accident and there is a trapped person. Could you come with us? And we just took the car from in front of the officials and we left on the road to cut the first car in our life. And we cut the car of who was at that time the director of the Pepsi Cola factory. And it was a very nice car. And he was very angry with us that we were cutting it to take him out. So this is how things started changing. We started calling people for training. Come and see what we are doing. We started calling others to show them. The secret is that the dream didn't stop there. Every time there was one more piece of the dream coming in. So I remember when we had the resus room, Keith Little came two times, three times to see us what we were doing. And then we were sitting with the president of the university and he said, uh, what next, Triad? What do you want next? I said, we want a full emergency department, like we see on the TV, like ER, like it is in the UK, like the one I saw in 1989 in, the in Merseyside in, in, in the UK, near Liverpool. So he said, yes, but this means the hospital has to give you the whole ground floor. And the immediate reaction of the president of the university, the, the rector, was, no way, it's sufficient. He got what he needs, what he's doing is fine, nothing more. Okay, so it was cut. Do you think I stopped dreaming? No. I kept on dreaming. And Dr. Little also kept on dreaming on how he is going to help us. So they found a way. We had a president of a council from Dunfermline in the UK who was visiting our president of council. He was in the governor's office and he fainted. They called us. We went there, picked him up. And where did we take him? to the resus room, which was done for us by the Scottish. And there was a Scottish nurse there. So when he went in, she went, how are you, love? How are you? And so on, and talking to him. He, was, he came back. He was nothing, nothing serious with him. And she started telling him the story. He didn't say anything. He left. And two months later, I get a phone call from Dr. Keith Little. And he says, right, we got you your emergency department. What? We got you your emergency department. How did you get them? 
We have a mobile, a, a modular building for you. And in my mind, modular building was something you go for camping with or something. It's not an emergency department, you know. And he said to me, trust me, it's something very serious. Okay. Big fight, several months fighting local pol medical political people from the health department who didn't want it, fighting everyone. But we also had people who helped us, the chief of the fire service who went and talked to the prime minister, our ambassador in London, Sergio Celak, who started giving phone calls and saying, do it, don't lose this project, and so on. And together with many people who started dreaming the same dream, we succeeded to bring, with the help of the BBC, a whole building on 18 trucks from Scotland to Romania. We built it in one month and started the first emergency department in Romania. And that was meant to stay for about five years until somebody is convinced and let us move into the ground floor of the hospital. We did this in 1994 and we moved to a real emergency department in the hospital in 2012. We started seeing patients 3,000 a year, and we ended before moving seeing 56,000 a year. But that dream was going on its way in Turgumuresh, but others started taking from that. Copying. Oradia copied the mobile resuscitation vehicle in 1993. Then Sibiu called, I want the same thing. We will help you. We do it. Then. We had the emergency room copied by Oradia, and then the Scottish called, do you want us to make another project? Yes, three cities. We do the emergency room, and we bring an ambulance for each one to do a mobile resuscitation unit. So we did Timishwara, we did Craiova, we did Constanza, and Constanza we failed to do the ambulance side, the smooth side, because they didn't want it. So we didn't do it in 1997, but we kept on pushing, and we did it in 2008. It's not hard to do this if you want to do it, and especially if you have a team with you, and you have people to support you, to help you, to work with you, and to trust you. And if you can trust them as well, and make your dream their dream as well. So this is how we succeeded to go on, get to the level where, of course, we started doing some other things. And I will give you another story, which I also said in other situations. The first response units, the firefighters, we see them now in the small cars, going in the ambulance cars or on the motorcycle, that they can defibrillate, they can work, they can do things. Why did we create these? Now there are many people who comment about this. They are only firefighters. Okay, they are only firefighters. Before I came here, I was with a delegation from the WHO. And we were visiting the fire department in Bucharest. And we were visiting all the equipment, and there was a motorcycle from the Smurd and the firefighter near it. And that motorcycle has a defibrillator, it has oxygen, it has everything on it. And the head of the delegation of the WHO, he said, OK, this is very good. How many lives, how many people did you see, and so on? So I asked the firefighter, how many cardiac arrests did you respond to? And he knew, he said, last year I went to 15 with his motorcycle. That is only him when he's on the shift. I said, okay. And what was the result? He said, between three and five, if I remember well, had their cardiac rhythm re-established before an ambulance arrived on the scene. So he saved lives. But he's a firefighter, but he's saving lives using a defibrillator, which is happening in many countries. But in Romania, that was something very unusual. The firefighters didn't do that in the 90s. They started doing it the first time in Turgu Mures, and then they started doing it more and more. And the only time when the whole country had fire department response, medical response team was 2012. So things have been moving. We started showing them that these people can save lives. The story of the first team like this is a sad one. We 
wanted to start the first, first response team with firefighters in Moorish County. And that was 1999, 2000, 2001. And I started advocating for this. We had a health department director, a new one who believed in us, but she was still a little bit, let's say, reserved. And I told them, you know, we are getting too late to patients in the rural areas. We are leaving from here, we are getting in 30 minutes, and we are seeing that the patients are dead if they have a cardiac arrest. We can do nothing. We need someone to respond immediately there. So we need to create first response teams. And the question was, OK, but where do you want to bring nurses, doctors? No, 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 no nurses, no doctors. Firefighters, like the French are doing, like the Americans are doing, like the Japanese are doing. Firefighters defibrillating? They are not doctors. They cannot do that. Yes, but they are doing it in other countries, and they are saving lives. So we brought a number of semi-automatic defibrillators. You cannot make a mistake with them. If I take one and I want to shock any one of you, that defibrillator will not let me do it, unless you are in cardiac arrest. So we wanted to do it. They convinced the mayor not to do it. A few months later, I get a phone call, and it was one of the three mayors in that area. And he says to me, please, Harry, my son was hit by a horse. He's at home. He's unconscious. And I am not at home. My mother called me and told me about that. So I said, OK, we will go immediately, but we are too far. I called an ambulance service in Reagan, which is nearer to them. But we left from Turgumuresh and arrived to them much faster than that ambulance service. We were the first to arrive. But we did all our best, and we declared the child, 11 years old, dead. And he looked and he said, after I bury my child, I will start the team you are telling me about since one year. And we opened that team about one and a half months later, two months later. And after that team, other towns started getting courage. So we opened one in Yernut, one in Sovata, one in Sigishwara, and within three months, the team in Yernut saved the first person defibrillated by firefighters three minutes after the call, and that person, two weeks later, came back on his feet, all okay. And if we did not have that team there, the nearest ambulance would have been 25 minutes away, and that patient would have been 100% dead. So it was worth it to fight. It was worth it to try to do things work. It is still worth it. If you think today it's easier, no, it is not easier. We still have people asking why, why we need to do this, why we need to do that. Every step we did had an idea which we saw or which we thought it is good, myself, my team, and we wanted to change things. And for every idea, we had to fight, to convince. But most of the time, the fights were not fair, because those who we were fighting didn't want to be convinced. They had their own preconceived ideas. They didn't want us to do this. So we always tried to find the right people in the right position to be able to change things. It was not easy. I got a lot of offers to go out of Romania and work out of Romania. I refused these offers, and I stayed in Romania. And there is a reason for that, because I knew I could change things. If I would have done to any of the offers I had, I would have been a small piece of a whole mechanism which is already working. But Romania needed and still needs change. And if we leave, there will be nobody to change things. So my decision was, I started something. I don't want others to destroy it. I will stay, and I will change things further. The issue is that every time we make a step and we want to make the next step, we still have people who question why we are doing this. And the biggest question I got all the time 
why are you doing this? And this question was coming from the beginning. When I changed my car, I had my own car, I sold it, I bought a cheaper one, and with the difference of the money, I bought the defibrillator, which was a second hand, the kit, everything, put on the car, the blue lights and so on. And the question of some people, was, why is he doing this? What is his interest in this? And it was useless to explain to them that there is no interest. They will never believe you. Some people thought that we want to make money out of it. We never made money. It never was for money. And people know that. Some people were saying, I even heard the weirdest stories about this. Like one story which was said, uh, he is training because we heard that if he makes 100,000 cases, he can go work in the States without any examinations immediately. But of course, that was a story which was said by someone, and it was a rumor going around in the 90s. But imagine who can make 100,000 cases, you know. But these were rumors just to minimize something which we were doing for nothing. Because most of the people think that it is unreasonable and it is something which is unimaginable that some people may do things for nothing. And the best thing is never to convince them or to try to convince them that they are not right. They will not believe you. So you do your work, you continue, they keep on talking. As we saw on Facebook, I, I, I put on Facebook just a few days ago a small film with our, one of our helicopters saving a tourist with the winch from the mountains. It went to two million and a half people. I have two and a half million or 2.2 million. There are a lot of comments. And some of these comments are very nasty. But most of the comments are very positive. This is how the world is. We should not be waiting for appreciation. We should be satisfied that what we are doing is the right thing. And then, if people will appreciate it, it's fine. If they don't, the idea is that we have to be convinced that what we are doing is right. And for me, I'm convinced that what I did together with my team and all those who supported us was right and is right. Did we finish or is there a moment that we will finish? I don't know. This is an ongoing story. When I will stop dreaming, others will be dreaming and will be taking it further. So this is a story of a system that has to evolve, may change, may become better. Some people may try to make it even worse maybe because they don't want it to be better. It's all something that we don't know what will happen with, but at this moment, it's our duty, my duty, my colleagues' duty, is to continue on dreaming and building up. This is why I stayed in Romania, is to continue the change that sometime I started it with my team, and I don't want to leave it, and I want to continue it. And I think that many of you in the future will be able to change things in Romania to the better if you are perseverant, if you keep on dreaming, and if you either if you identify the field that you are going to be excellent in so that you can do the change in it. So good luck with your life ahead. Thank you. <laughs>